We want the new year to be happy and auspicious, which means we have to think about the principles of what makes a year auspicious and how is happiness found. The Buddha taught the principles for what makes a day auspicious, and they apply to years as well. It's what you do. You see clearly what's going on in the mind. You're not concerned about the past. You're not concerned about the future. You're very concerned about the present moment. You see clearly what arises, and then you do your duty. This part is often missed. You often think that insight means simply watching things arising and passing away and letting them arise, letting them pass away. But as the Buddha understood, things don't just arise and pass away on their own. We play a role. The present doesn't come to us ready-made. We have a role in shaping it, both through our past actions and, very importantly, through our present actions, which is why we have duties. And these relate to the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths relate to the issue of happiness. They are about suffering. The First Noble Truth is suffering itself. The second one is the cause. The third is the cessation of suffering. And the fourth is the path to the cessation. But the reason the Buddha taught these teachings about stress and suffering because you can't understand happiness until you understand suffering. You can't find happiness until you've understood suffering and completed the duties with regard to these truths. The Buddha learned this lesson the hard way. Living in the palace, he saw that whatever happiness he had was going to be subject to aging, illness, and death. It wasn't going to last. And then where would he be? He realized that Happiness required finding something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. And to find that, he was going to have to look in the mind. So he left home, went into the wilderness, found some teachers who taught what they said was the way to true happiness. It's basically hiding out in the formless jhanas. Began to realize that that was just running away from the problem of suffering. And running away, you didn't get away. You'd get pulled back. So then he ran in the other direction. He ran toward the suffering, thinking that somehow by enduring suffering, he would purify his mind. And that might lead to true happiness. Well, he almost killed himself. And he learned you don't just burn away your past karma. You have to understand things. And the understanding started with practicing right concentration, like we're trying to do right now. Drop all thoughts of sensuality. In other words, all fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures, how you would like to have these sights, these sounds, these smells, tastes, tactile sensations. Any unskillful qualities having to do with ill will for anyone, the desire to harm anyone, either yourself or others. You put those thoughts aside. Just focus on the breath, the body in and of itself right here, right now. And the breath is the most right here, right now, in and of itself kind of thing you can watch. It's try to breathe in a way that feels easeful inside to be aware of the whole body. These are all the Buddha's instructions. Be aware of the whole body. Breathe in a way that makes you sensitive to rapture, sensitive to pleasure. And the rapture and the pleasure come from being sensitive down through the torso, down through the legs and the arms, and seeing what kind of breathing feels good there when you have a good, comfortable breath sensation. Try to maintain it. However long the breath or short the breath it may have to be. And then allow that sense of well-being to spread 
So you breathe in, it's as if the whole body is breathing in. You breathe out, the whole body is breathing out. The whole body is bathed in good breath sensations. The Buddha put his mind into this state of right concentration. And it was from right concentration that he began to understand things. He gave three knowledges on the night of his awakening. The first knowledge was that death is not the end. You don't put an end to the problems of aging, illness, and death simply by dying. Because death is followed by rebirth, which is followed by more death. Redeath, you might say. More rebirth, more redeath. So the question is, why is there this pattern of going up and down from one birth to the next? Because that's what he saw. It wasn't a clear progression going ever upward. It would go up and go down, then go down and go further down, then up again. He said it's like throwing a stick up into the air. Sometimes it landed on this end, sometimes it landed on that end, sometimes it landed splat in the middle. The question was why? He came to second knowledge. Seeing all living beings dying and then being reborn, he saw it was in line with their actions, particularly their actions as were informed by their intentions and their intentions as informed by their views. And he saw that the working out of karma is a very simple principle. You act on skillful intentions, happiness results. You act on unskillful intentions, pain, suffering results. But the working out is very complex, because as you saw, what you experience any moment is not just the results coming in from past karma, it's also your present karma. Your thoughts, the way you breathe, the way you perceive things, right here, right now. They take the raw material from the past, like a cook taking food out of a refrigerator and then fixing it into something you can actually eat. So take influences coming from the past and then shape them into a present experience. So I realized you had to see what you were doing that contributed to the suffering right here, right now. You had to see cause and effect. So it wasn't just a matter of accepting things as they are. It's realizing that things as they are are shaped by what you're doing. And to understand cause and effect, you're going to have to change the causes to see what causes what, which causes lead to good effects, which causes lead to bad effects. This is why when we practice concentration, we don't just sit with whatever comes up. We intentionally create a sense of well-being inside, because that allows us to see very clearly how the mind shapes the present. When you get more sensitive to that, that fact right here, right now, then you begin to see it at other times when you're not creating sense, sense of well-being, you're actually creating suffering for yourself, and you can see why. As with any scientist, you change the causes and you see the results. You change them again, you see the results again to get a sense of what is actually causing the suffering. So we find happiness not by running away from suffering or pretending that it doesn't exist. There's a tradition in some countries that on the New Year's you don't talk about pain or suffering at all for fear that it's going to blight the New Year. But that's not a Buddhist attitude. The Buddhist attitude is you look at it straight on and you comprehend it. You see where you're holding on to things in a way that gives rise to suffering. In fact, the holding on itself is the suffering. And you're not going to see that unless you experiment. So the meditation is an exploration. to see what you're doing right now and the results of what you're doing. And so the Buddha never explained his awakening in terms of 
the three characteristics. It was always the Four Noble Truths, and the Four Noble Truths are about cause and effect. You attack suffering at the cause. You find that the cause is craving. That's what you let go. And you can understand that connection when you see that what the suffering is. So it's comprehending cause and effect. That allows you to get beyond the suffering, to find something, as the Buddha said, that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. What he set his mind to find, he actually found. But it wasn't by running away from suffering or running straight toward it. It was by understanding it. That makes us realize that if we're going to have a new year, we're going to have to understand how we cause suffering, how we cause stress. The word dukkha in Pali is a hard one to translate because it has such a wide range of meaning, everything from very subtle levels of stress in the mind to really strong suffering. But it's basically creating a weight on the mind, or as the John Mahabhu would say, putting a squeeze on the mind. You scar by simple things like looking at physical pain. Why is it that physical pain causes pain for the mind? What are you holding on to? You look into it. You find you're holding on to the body. You're holding on to the feelings. You're holding on to your awareness of these things. You're holding on very precisely to your perceptions, in other words, the labels you place on things around the pain, around your body, around your mind. And so first you want to experiment by seeing, are there ways of breathing, are there ways of talking to yourself, are there ways of creating perceptions that can minimize the pain? So you experiment with different ways of breathing. You ask yourself about your perceptions around the pain. Do you perceive it as invading your body? How about perceiving it as something separate from the body? What does that do? Do you perceive it as a solid block? How about perceiving it as moments of pain that come and go? What does that do? And when they come, are they coming at you or are they going away? Which perception is better? Or if you find yourself cringing away from the pain, you may say, well, how about going into the pain? Well, at first it requires that you have a sense of well-being in some other part of the body, so that you know that you can always have a place to retreat to if you have to. And you can also think of that sense of well-being going through the pain, penetrating it, going out the other side. to relieve any tension you may have created around the pain. Then you go into it try to find what is the sharpest point of the pain. You'll find that it wanders, moves. You think you've got it located and it's gone someplace else. It's like playing with a bead of mercury. People don't allow their children to do that anymore, but in the old days, if a thermometer got broken, the mercury came out, you got to play with the mercury, and you found it wouldn't stay. You push it and it goes off someplace else. Well, it's the same with that sharp point of pain, the worst point of the pain. It moves. As so you keep after it, keep after it, and you find that it separates out. Sometimes it even disappears, goes into your heart and goes away. Other times it stays, but it's separate from the body. It's because you question it, explore it. Try different perceptions, try different ways of breathing, try different ways of talking to yourself about the pain. That you begin to understand what you're doing that creates the mental pain that doesn't have to be there. We take it for granted that where there's physical pain, there's going to be mental pain. But one of the major messages the Buddha taught was it doesn't have to be that way. It's from our lack of skill 
our lack of understanding, that we glom those two things together. But if you can separate them out, then you find that it is possible to be happy even in the presence of pain. The mind can be at ease, even though there may be pain in the body. That's one of the first steps in realizing that the Buddha is right. Causes for suffering are not things outside. They're not pains in the body or horrible things that people are doing outside. They come from our own lack of skill. These causes are suffering. The different cravings and then the clingings that follow on them. They come from within. Which is why we meditate. We don't meditate by going out there and examining society and examining the world. We meditate by looking into the mind, because this is where the real problem is. This is where the solution is. It's by understanding how the mind causes suffering. Now this principle of causation actually works. We can get beyond it. And in getting beyond it, we find that there's a happiness that is not affected by anything. Because it lies outside of space, outside of time. That's the happiness we're after. So if you wanted to wish yourself a really happy new year, an auspicious new year, remind yourself, what makes it auspicious is what you do. Doing your duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths. And you fulfill those duties by exploring what's going on, what you're doing right here, right now, and how you can change what you're doing, learning about cause and effect. So you can learn how to stop causing suffering. When you stop doing it, where is suffering going to come from? Things outside may be bad. There's no guarantee. Last year we wished everyone a Happy New Year. We wished ourselves a Happy Happy New Year. And look at what we got. More war. More inequality. All kinds of horrible things are happening outside. And this is nothing new. It's every year, in the time of the Buddha, horrible things were happening in society. The Buddha said, it's not by changing things outside that you're going to be happy. It's by changing your things inside. That's where happiness comes from. So explore inside. Poke around inside. Ask questions about your perceptions. Ask questions about the way you talk to yourself. Ask questions about the way you breathe. Try new things. Make it a really new year. Use your ingenuity. And John Fung, when he would teach meditation, the two words he would use more than anything else would be observant and use your ingenuity. Try things out, and if they don't work, then try to figure out something else that might work. This is how we learn, and it's in learning in this way that we can find things of real value. things that do make the year auspicious and do make it happy.